I had the book. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. It's a great book. Uh, I really enjoy it. So yeah, he's got a lot of funny, a lot of funny things in there and some pretty crazy questions. Um, he's written a few others too now. Um, like, uh, uh, he has one called how to and, um, and thing explainer, which I like a lot too. You should check those out, Max. So, um, all right. What'd you guys think of the article? Anyone else read the book or, or have the book yeah. other than Max? It's kind of a funny story. Randall Monroe, he's a, he's a physicist, um, and he started drawing these sort of comic book, you know, stick figure things on the side, and he started to make more money doing that than he was doing physics research. Uh, and so he kind of uh, does that more, but they're pretty brainy little um, comics that he draws, which are great. So, um, all right, let's see how you felt. So who figured it out? What's 0 0.9 C? Six, a lot, it's a big number. Yeah, but what, what did he mean by that? Because that's in the text, he just says that, like, let's assume the baseball is going at 0 0.9 C. What is he referring to by 0 0.9 C? 90% the speed of light. Yeah, so again, that's scientist jargon. The 0 0.9 is 90%. C represents the speed of light, um, which is actually about 300 million meters per second, which is pretty crazy. Um, but he translates that to, so we're only doing 90% of that, and he translated it into miles per hour. Lila was getting at this. What was the speed? Anyone know in miles per hour? Um, 604, 604 what? million. It is million. million. 604 million miles per hour. Think about that for a second, right? Uh, that is an unimaginably fast speed, right? Um, impossible to throw, uh, especially a pitcher with your arm uh, at that speed. But also then think about it. if you had something moving that fast through the air, so what, what happens if the pitcher were actually somehow able to release the ball that it accelerated to 604 million miles per hour, what's gonna happen then if the baseball is gonna do that? Yeah, everyone, everyone does this. What does this mean? Explosion. Yeah, why? Why does it explode? Because it's like, is it because it's going through the air so quickly? It is going through the air so fast that what are air molecules not able to do? Um. Normally, when you throw a baseball, air molecules would move out of the way, right? That's what we call drag. But if it's going 604 million miles per hour, it fuses with the air molecules. Yeah, they can't get out of the way. It literally smashes into them on a molecular level, like they react. Uh, and so that's called a fusion reaction. Uh, and a fusion reaction is a type of nuclear reaction. That's what's happening in our sun. Um, the sun is um, the fusion of hydrogen atoms to create helium. Uh, and so you would basically be creating a, a miniature sun or a similar reaction to that uh, if you were to throw a baseball, even at 90% the speed of light. Uh, so yeah, you'd have gamma radiation, a shock wave coming off of it, followed by a huge fireball. Um, pretty nuts. So uh, why then, what are a couple reasons why the batter would not be able to hit the ball? I thought this was the best part of the article. There would be no batter. Yeah, so the batter will have been blown away already. <laughs> what else? There's another funny reason. If they weren't blown away, they wouldn't like be able to see it coming because like they can't see that the pitcher has released it until like the ball gets to them. Yes, that, that light information of, oh, the pitcher threw the ball would arrive at the same time as the ball, <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny. Uh, and also, again, we keep talking about the ball approaching the pitcher, but in reality, if the ball, again, were to actually reach home plate, um, it would not be a baseball anymore. Anyone catch on what it would be? Um, like, kind of just like a, a cloud. Yeah, they, he references a, a bullet-shaped bullet piece of plasma, plasma um, which is basically, yeah, plasma is like a cloud. It's like a, a electrified gas. Um, yeah, not something you could effectively swing at. So, uh, following baseball rules, if they did say, okay, well, the pitcher was hit by the, uh, the or the batter was hit by the ball, why would he not be able to uh, advance to first base? Because he wouldn't exist. He wouldn't exist, and also, what else wouldn't exist? The first base. First base or the stadium, it would all be a giant crater. So, um, yes, yeah, so hopefully this is not something that would actually happen. But uh, we are, again, today going to explore what's happening with drag. Um, this wasn't exactly the best example of that. This is more such a fast speed that it's literally fusing with the air molecules. But uh, we're going to talk today about how air molecules would normally move out of the way and how that affects 
uh, a baseball pitch and also how that gives you different types of pitches and things like that. So uh, before I delve into that though, I wanted to review the quiz that you all took right before the long weekend. And you might've noticed that I used the long weekend to catch up on a lot of grading. So I graded your presentation, Ocean Issues Projects. I graded a bunch of different things. Um, so I encourage you actually on Canvas, um, if you go to uh, the science course and if you click on grades, everything should be pretty much up to date now. Uh, so if you've got any missing assignments or anything like that, now's the time to go look at those and figure out how you could get them into me. Um, but also if you click on the quiz, that you just took, the Ocean Issues and Gravity Quiz, you should see a graded version of it. Um, I wrote a couple comments on some answers uh, if I took points off of things, so you can go check that out. So I encourage you to do that right now uh, on your Canvas page. Um, but what I'm gonna do is just go over the quiz really quickly and feel free to jump in and ask questions if you want. Uh, the first couple questions were multiple choice and they were all related to the Ocean Issues presentations. In fact, did anyone see, had you seen these questions before? Yes. These were taken from the do nows that we did kind of in between. Um, some of them were kind of new, but um, birds die due to exposure for oil because their feathers get ruined, right? So they can't insulate, they can't fly, they can't float. All of those were um, valid options. Um, biomagnification threatens top predators like eagles and killer whales because it builds up with every organism that is eaten by another organism. Um, however, eagles and killer whales aside, who else should be nervous about this? Who else is at the top of the food chain? Us. Yeah, humans. So definitely not a good situation. Uh, the eutrophication question, everyone did great. Um, the only mistakes I saw were sometimes some people mentioned the sewage and fertilizer at the end rather than at the beginning. That should be the first step. Uh, but it was worth two points and I only ever took off one point. No one got it completely wrong. Um, so, And then mollusks include squid, clams, and snails. Anything with a soft body and a hard shell does not include crabs because crabs actually have an exoskeleton. So does anyone know what group, uh, or I should say, what subphylum we put crabs under? They're not mollusks. Crustacean? Crustacean would be the order, and yeah, arthropod is the subphylum. But yes, crustacean is also a correct uh, category for them. But yeah, there are arthropods is the kind of the subphylum for the animal kingdom, and then crustacea is the next level down. Yep. Uh, you had to choose one of the um, ocean issues and uh, write about it. Anyone want to guess which one was the most popular? Which one did almost everyone write about? Fishing. Uh, overfishing was a very common one, but the leading one was actually plastic pollution. So almost everyone wrote, wrote about either plastic pollution or overfishing. Uh, it was funny that those two were like the most popular. So again, I might have taken a point off if I th felt you were lacking certain details or if you didn't talk about how it's being addressed, but otherwise, uh, pretty good job on those. You then had to talk about why the ISS and the moon aren't falling towards Earth. Like a pear, this is sort of the, uh, or an apple. Um, you know, this was from the very beginning of the unit, but it's stuff we're gonna talk about today as well. You had to mention tangential velocity and you had to define that term to get the full points for it, um, about how they're moving parallel to the planets with enough speed to allow them to fall around it. And again, it's something we're gonna explore a little bit more today. Uh, between Ben and Kelly, uh, Kelly is more correct, gravity is not, require an atmosphere. Um, some people still got confused by this. Um, most of you got at the idea that there's no such thing as zero gravity. That seemed to be the key thing, is that you understood there's no such thing as zero gravity, so Kelly's gotta be correct because Ben's claiming that there would be no gravity. However, even though most of you were able to say that, that there's no gravity, the next question where you had to define weightlessness versus mass, being massless, uh, a lot of you then turned around and said, well, actually there is no gravity in space or there's less gravity. Uh, and that's not exactly the case. So you had good, if you define both terms, mass and weight, great. But weightlessness with astronauts is actually due to free fall. It's, it's exactly the same as the OK Go video. Um, they were in free fall inside an airplane, so they experienced weightlessness for about 27 seconds. Astronauts experience weightlessness permanently because they're in a shuttle or a space station that is falling around the Earth, right, all the time. Uh, again, this is something we're gonna talk a bit more about today. Uh, but I saw some confusion there. Uh, everyone got the multiple choice question that uh, mass is directly proportional, larger mass, more gravitational force, and distance is inverse. So further away, you're actually gonna have less gravitational force. Uh, you then had to talk about the OK Go video. Again, everyone got that the, they, how they claimed that they filmed in zero gravity is incorrect, that they were just weightless. They were in a, in a free fall. You didn't have to exactly explain what was going on, but if you mentioned that, that was good. The inner ear gives us our sense of balance our, and direction and also our sense of acceleration. Again, some of you were talking about hearing, which is great. Yes, the ear is used for hearing, but that's not how it's relevant to this particular part of our unit. 
and then you had to make the Flipgrid video. Uh, if you go on the Flipgrid, I, I left a little comment on each of your videos and I showed you what points I gave you. Most people got full points. If your explanation was kind of short or was lacking certain details, I took a, usually about a point off. That was about it. Uh, and then the extra credit, if you tried it and got it wrong, I still gave you one point. If you got it correct, I gave you the full three points. Common mistake I saw there was that people did not convert kilometers into meters. You have to convert 4.9 kilometers into 4,900 meters in order to use the gravitational constant G because that's in meters. Okay, otherwise, I um, think it was out of 35 points. Most people did really well. I um, think it kind of boosted most people's assessment averages overall. Uh, any questions on that or anything you want me to look over in particular? How'd you feel about taking a Canvas quiz, open notes? Like that all went smoothly, felt good about it? All right, I think that's what assessments will look like uh, in our class. I might try one or two other things. Um, I've actually heard that cahoots work really well as, as real assessments, which is kind of interesting. So anyway, that's <laughs> something we might try. Um, all right, so next what I want you to do is an activity uh, relating to the next part of chapter five. You're going to use that same FET simulation we've used in the past. Looks like this. Um, there will be instructions in the little Canvas quiz that you'll work on. There's, there's just three questions I want you to answer. And it's going to relate to the intro as well as the drag. Uh, you'll be using the drag option there as well. So uh, again, this is task number three, activity. Use the um, projectile motion FET to answer these questions on this classwork. It's called U4L14 classwork, altitude range, and drag. Only three questions. I'm gonna give us about eight minutes to work on it. Um, again, I'll be listening if you have any questions, but we'll reconvene after eight minutes to review it. Uh, and let me know if you need help or something isn't working. Go for it. All right, um, eight minutes has elapsed. Looks like about nine of you have submitted your responses. So um, last two people just try to wrap up. Were you all able to get this simulation to work? Instructions were clear? All right, uh, so what I'm actually gonna do now is di dive into just a, a short set of review slides for these next few parts of chapter um, five, and I'll touch on these activities that you did and ask you some questions about what you observed as we go through them. So feel free to take some notes if you want, um, or in your digital notebook or on paper. I also have um, posted a video recording of me going through these same slides that you can watch later as well if you want. Uh, but the goal is to review, oops, sorry, this is actually for our next lesson. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself here. Here we go. Uh, this will be chapter 5.9 through 5.11, um, talking about altitude range, the influence of drag on projectiles, and then talking about this idea of satellites. And uh, relates to sports like baseball, um, golf is another one I'll talk about a lot. And also, a lot of you are probably familiar with a lot of this because of a particular phone game. Anyone know what this is representing here? Angry Birds. Yes, Angry Birds is all projectile motion. That's all it is. You're firing these bird projectiles and trying to knock out these little pigs. Uh, I don't know how exactly they simulate the physics um, within the game. It's actually usually pretty reliable, but um, that's what this is all about. So uh, the first part of the activity that you had to do, uh, you had to fire a projectile at, at different angles, 25 and 65, 40 and 50, 60 and 30. What did you notice when you fired projectiles at those two angle pairs? They landed in the same spot. Yep. Uh, and so what's the pattern? Did anyone find the relationship between 25 and 65, 40 and 50, 60, 30? They what do you add notice? To 90. Yes. So for all of those, if you add the two numbers together, you get 90 degrees. Uh, and I didn't know that. It's kind of cool that if you fire at any two angles, if they add up to 90, the projectile will land in the same spot. Now, uh, this is assuming a few things. First of all, what, where is the um, cannon? Where is the projectile being fired from? From the ground. Yeah, from ground level, right? So it's, this is true as long as the projectile is being fired from the um, same horizontal level as where the projectile is going to land. And also, they're assuming pretty much an absence of what? Drag. Yeah, so no air, no drag. This is an ideal situation. All right, so this brings in two important vocabulary terms that I think are kind of obvious, but I just want to make sure you're understanding them. Uh, what is altitude when you're talking about projectiles? Just how high it goes. Yep, uh, it's the maximum height, right? And I believe it's measured from where it was fired from, right? So you could have a projectile that falls below 
its original point, but I believe the altitude is measured by um, where it was fired from and it's the maximum height that it reaches. Okay, what about range? What is range then? The like distance. Yep, maximum distance that it traveled horizontally, right? Uh, so you can think of it as kind of a big upside down T uh, that frames our little parabola of projectile motion here. And that's important um, because it tells you a lot about where it's going to land. Uh, and so think about why would this be a good thing to be able to calculate altitude and range, and then also to be able to predict, um, think about historically, like how is this useful? Again, think about what you've been using here. Who is this relevant to in history to be able to predict altitude and range? People who shot themselves out of cannons? <laughs> Shooting yourself out of a cannon, but more importantly, uh, were cannons used as weapons oh, often? Yeah. They were. And so being able to predict that as well, of knowing a certain angle to fire at, um, and it was hard. Cannons can be pretty unreliable. It's literally just a big hunk of metal being fired out. But uh, even in uh, modern warfare, um, there are things called mortars, which are essentially firing a grenade into the air, and it follows a little parabola and will land at a certain location. And so you often have soldiers reporting back coordinates of targets that mortars who are much further back can then fire at. Uh, and so it's, and it all relies on a very good understanding of altitude and range, and also how things like wind drag and stuff are going to affect that. Uh, so all pretty relevant. Um, good. So next slide is just summarizing exactly what uh, we took away from this, that they add up to 90. Uh, another interesting point from this chapter 5.9 is that speed is also consistent. Um, so it's just the difference in the direction. But again, if you're firing a projectile upwards, uh, like so, uh, if it's traveling 30 meters per second in an upwards direction at this elevation, then by the time it's returning back down to the ground, it will have accelerated to that exact same uh, speed again, right? It just has a different velocity, a different direction that it's traveling. Uh, and it does achieve, I think, zero vertical climb at the, at the very top when it's reached its top altitude. Um, but anyway, kind of interesting to see that. Uh, again, I think this is assuming an ideal situation that there's no air drag. So I think in reality, this doesn't actually quite work that I think the um, speeds maybe vary a little bit more um, due to drag. But interesting thing to see that that's consistent as well. Okay, so the next part of the FET simulation that you did uh, was to then go to the drag option, fire off one as an example um, right here in the middle. So that was your initial shot and then that was what we were then comparing things to. So what happened to the altitude and uh, range when you increased the drag? It decreased. Yeah, everyone see how the altitude is actually a little bit shorter compared to the other one, and even the range is actually a little bit shorter. So both things are affected by drag. Don't think that it's only the horizontal movement or only the vertical movement. Both are influenced by drag and reduced. What about when you reduce the drag? When you took the drag coefficient down 0 0.20, what do you notice about altitude and range? They increase. Yeah, we got our highest altitude and our farthest range. Uh, and so you can see that there are benefits to being aerodynamic, right? If you have a projectile that uh, they make this sort of teardrop shape, and that's because it's meant to represent uh, something that has, um, is going to travel through the air more efficiently, that has less drag on it. Um, and that's what aerodynamics is all about. Uh, when you think about things like athletic equipment, uh, design of cars, design of airplanes, everything goes into being aerodynamic to reduce drag because that makes traveling a lot easier. Um, I often think about a uh, golf ball. Um, what is the surface of a golf ball like? How would you describe the surface of a golf ball? Like bumpy, I guess. Yeah, it's got all those kind of like little pits in it, right? They're, they're like bumps, but they're inverse, right? It's like they dug them out. Um, is that just for decoration? Does that just make the golf balls look unique? What do you think? To just make the drag less, to make the golf ball's path more efficient. Yeah, in fact, as far as like circular um, spheres go, golf balls are some of the most aerodynamic uh, balls that are used in sports. Uh, they're meant to be that way. Uh, and that's why golfers are able to hit balls at such extreme distances, even in stormy weather and things like that. Um, baseball is where this sort of comes up a lot, that uh, most baseball pitches are in the 90 mile per hour category, which is pretty nuts. 
Uh, but if you were to give a baseball pitcher a golf ball to throw, they would be uh, achieving much higher throwing speeds, right? Um, because a golf ball is way more aerodynamic than a baseball is. Um, so kind of interesting to, to think about how that relates to um, athletic stuff as well. Okay. So again, this is kind of the gist, I think uh, they use this image in your textbook that uh, you have an ideal path, which is ignoring the influence of drag, but in reality, things don't actually achieve the altitude or range that they do um, if you were to just calculate forces, right? You have to take the fact of air drag into account. You're always gonna fall short. And this is again, what golfers and baseball players and uh, people are constantly battling um, just because you have drag acting on objects that are thrown. In fact, this is also what contributes to the different pitches that you see in baseball, and, and I didn't know this, um, but uh, things like a fastball and a curveball actually all relate to drag. Uh, if a baseball was just fired without any spin on it whatsoever, you can see here drag acts equally on all parts of the baseball, and it would just fly perfectly straight, probably curve downward a little bit um, because gravity will, will drag it down. But uh, what baseball pitchers are often doing is they're applying spin to their throws. And what that does is uh, the part of the ball that is spinning into the air it's traveling through, spinning towards it, is gonna experience a lot more drag. And down on the bottom, it's gonna experience a lot less drag, which I think then increases the force on the bottom. It, it basically creates what they call the Magnus force over here, but um, it keeps the ball in the air. Um, so it's a thing like a fastball, Fastballs don't actually curve down towards the earth due to gravity. They actually are able to stay um, up or even float, move upward a little bit because of this magnus force. It's the spin of the ball that then um, causes it to rise a bit. Um, same thing with a curveball. I, I like these images because you can look at the wake, right? Here's a baseball just traveling perfectly straight. Um, and here's what I'm thinking of is like deflected weight. So that's kind of creating more of that curve, um, like a curveball throw that a, a pitcher would, um, would throw. And so this is what pitchers are constantly trying to do. They're trying to put just enough spin on the baseball that it curves a little bit or it stays in the air. Um, it's tricking the batter, right? The pitcher wants to confuse the batter and have them swing at something that might not actually be there. It gets really hard if you're a batter to try to predict where uh, a ball that's spinning and moving really fast is going to end up. And so this is kind of the, what makes a good pitcher is being able to um, throw a baseball with enough spin on it that it still goes over home plate, right? You still need to get it within that little box so that it's a strike if the, uh, if the batter misses it, but you want it to be really hard for the batter to predict where the ball is going to be and, and hard to swing at. So kind of interesting. And I guess that means that if you were in space or on the moon where there's no atmosphere, no air, you can't really throw a fastball or a curveball. Um, I don't know if anyone's tested that before, but kind of interesting thing to think about. Okay, one more section of chapter five to get through, but any questions on altitude range or drag? Feeling okay on those? Okay, then the last thing is to introduce this idea of what we call satellites. Uh, and this is actually gonna be, we're gonna explore this in more detail in our next lesson, uh, but you've gotta sort of take a couple things um, and keep them in your mind for this. So to explore satellites, again, we're, we're looking at um, the vertical velocity and the horizontal velocity of a projectile, right? Always think of the forces acting um, flat horizontally and vertically going down. So you have to take this idea into mind. If we were, had a projectile that's going to fall five meters, that's the given distance. Um, if you were on Earth, Earth's gravity, it takes any projectile about one second to, five, to fall five meters, right? So I want you to associate these two things with each other, right? You're always gonna take one second to fall vertically five meters. However, the path horizontally, the range, um, it depends on how much force is applied horizontally to your projectile, right? If there's only a small amount of force, then the projectile isn't gonna travel very far in, far in the one second, right? It's still gonna fall five meters, but it'll only move forward, I don't know, that probably looks like five or six meters. But if you were to apply a whole lot of force uh, horizontally, even though it's still falling for only one second, right? The time isn't changing. The projectile will go a lot further because even though it still is only falling five meters down, it's gonna, it had a lot more force horizontally and it, it therefore achieves a much greater horizontal distance. Okay, so with that in mind, um, you know, the harder, the more force we apply horizontally, the farther we can get our projectile to travel. What do you guys notice about the ground in this drawing? Is it flat? No. 
And so this is trying to accurately depict Earth. And again, I'm hoping that we're all in agreement on this, but would you say Earth is round or is Earth flat? It's round. Believe it or not, there are some people out there that are adamant in their belief that Earth is flat. Um, so that's an argument to have it at a different time, but we're gonna go ahead and say that Earth is round. Uh, and so hopefully one question that pops into your head then is, well, then how round is Earth, right? Um, it's definitely not round enough for our eyes to easily perceive it. Uh, and it turns out that the curvature of the Earth, um, if we stick to this example of five meters, um, a five meter drop from the horizontal, uh, then it takes about 8,000 meters of horizontal distance to see a drop of five meters in the ground, right? So that's the curvature of the Earth. If you were to start here horizontally, um, you would have a five meter difference at 8,000 meters. Um, what's a much easier way to represent 8,000 meters? How could I rewrite that? Eight what? Anyone know? Kilometers. Eight kilometers, right? So that's what I'm gonna use from now on. Let's think of 8,000 meters as eight kilometers. Okay, so what this means is that for every eight kilometers, um, the Earth is curving downward five meters. Um, so just to put this in context, uh, if you think about like if you were in a boat, like a sailboat over here, I'm an excellent artist at this. Uh, and if you were looking out at the horizon, so you're looking this way, that's you on your boat. If there was another sailboat over here and it had a mast that was only five meters tall, which is pretty short for a sailboat. Most sailboats have much taller mass, but let's say if it had a five meter mass, uh, if you were looking out over the horizon, would you be able to see that boat if it was eight kilometers away? No. You wouldn't, which I know is a weird thing to think, but it is below the horizon, right? Uh, and so that's what they mean by five meter curvature. Okay, so with all that in mind, now instead of looking out, what if we were able to throw a projectile? So let's say you had a baseball or a golf ball, something like that, and you threw it perfectly horizontal, which again, we'll talk about how that would be a hard thing to do. But if you were able to throw it perfectly horizontal um, with enough horizontal force that it's gonna travel eight kilometers. And can anyone remind me, how much time does it take a projectile to fall five meters again? What was the given time? One second. One second. So if you were able to throw a projectile horizontally at eight kilometers per second, so that every second it's gonna travel these eight kilometers and also fall down five meters, when would it hit the ground? And it's kind of a trick question. Take a guess. Two seconds? Uh-huh, go ahead, Tammy. Uh, it wouldn't hit the ground. It would not hit the ground. Um, very good. I know it's a weird thing to think, but if you were able to throw it with enough power that it's traveling eight kilometers every second, and therefore it's only falling five meters, it would literally stay just above the ground. It would never actually hit the ground and stop because it's matching the curvature of the earth. Um, so I guess a better example would be if we were like, you know, 10 meters off the ground or something, and you had that space to use. <laughs> But you have achieved what is basically called orbit. Um, so it would just be in a continuous fall around Earth. So they have this kind of silly drawing here, but you could hit yourself in the back of the head uh, if you were able to throw it with enough horizontal force to keep it falling around the Earth, or you would turn around and catch it. Uh, if anyone's a Rick and Morty fan, um, at the end of, I think, the second or third season of Rick and Morty, they have to like escape to a planet um, to live on, like it's their new home. Does anyone know what's weird about that planet? No gravity. It's tiny. It's really, really tiny, right? And so there's a scene where um, Morty is basically playing Frisbee with himself where he throws a Frisbee uh, and then he turns around and he catches the same Frisbee again. And so that's the thing is that he, he threw it with enough um, force that it was able to travel horizontally but also downward to match the curvature of the planet they were on. So um, let's think about doing this on planet Earth though. It's gonna get a little tricky. Um, so the minimum necessary speed is going to be eight kilometers per second. And if you're able to do that, uh, you have created what's called a satellite. Um, and so this is a good vocab term to get down. A satellite is any projectile that moves fast enough to fall continuously around our planet, right? It is orbiting at that point. Um, I know eight kilometers per second is a weird thing to think about. So in reality, that is equal to 18,000 miles per hour, uh, which is way less than what we were seeing in the do now. 
right? The do now, that was 90% the speed of light. But this is still a pretty insane speed. Um, this is not something that a baseball pitcher could achieve. Um, again, they're, they're throwing at about 90 miles per hour. Uh, this is 18,000. Uh, do you think this is something that, um, like in the do now, could you really feasibly do this and have something continue to travel at this speed in our atmosphere? What do you think? It would. You'd have atmospheric friction, right? A projectile would be moving so fast um, that it would basically get destroyed, right? Uh, and drag also would just slow it down, so it wouldn't be able to maintain the necessary speed to continuously fall around our planet. So we need to get out of the atmosphere. And it turns out that if you get 150 kilometers up, you are outside of Earth's atmosphere. There's no more gases. Uh, and so that's why satellites, the moon, space shuttles, the ISS are all at least 150 kilometers up, if not higher. And therefore, they're able to orbit safely around our planet without any friction uh, from any gases or the atmosphere. Uh, and so all of these things are just falling around our planet. So again, I know I've been throwing a lot at you here. But I think if you take nothing else away from this, um, this was a very, it's a very common misconception to think that at high altitudes, like at 150 kilometers uh, out in space, that you're under less gravity or that there's no gravity out there. And that's why astronauts are weightless. That is not true. Uh, it's weird to think, but an astronaut in space is experiencing pretty much just as much gravity as you are here on the surface of the Earth, right? The reason that they appear to be weightless is because they are in free fall, right? They are in a shuttle or in a space um, station that is continually falling around the planet because it's moving at 18,000 miles per hour horizontally and matching the curvature of the Earth as the Earth is as they're falling towards the Earth. Um, so it's just like that OKGO OK video, they're just doing it continuously. Um, so that's the key thing is that you have that tangential velocity. So it all comes back to the very start of that chapter. So I think that's a good. Um, thing to keep in mind in a misconception that hopefully uh, is cleared up a little bit for you. So just to show you a little animation of what this looks like, uh, we're going to see a projectile here that's going to be launched with different speeds. And you'll see that in the beginning, the speed is too low and it doesn't match, the parabola doesn't match the curvature of the Earth, so it's going to hit the surface of the planet. But eventually, you'll get enough speed that it will continually fall around the planet. And so there you go. That last one had just enough speed on it that it was able to then fall uh, continuously around the planet, right? The parabola that it's following matches the curvature of the planet. Now, again, just to get a little specific though, uh, is Earth a perfect sphere? Anyone know? No. It isn't. And so I don't know exactly what's going on there in terms of the physics about that. Um, there must be some exceptions or you know, at some point it's further away than not. Um, so this is sort of a, a simplified look at that. Um, but otherwise, that explains how satellites are launched and are able to stay um, circling the planet. And again, we're going to continue to explore that in our next lesson as well. Okay. Any questions on any of that? You'll be reading about it uh, tonight as well. So uh, and answering a couple questions. Okay. Uh, do you have any question? Yeah. What, wouldn't they like? eventually like start losing like their acceleration and then fall back to earth they do so as far as i know in reality when you look at the international space station or shuttles they are constantly doing what are called corrections right where they're mean they're tr checking their speed they're checking the the distance from the surface of the earth and i think they are constantly still adjusting their acceleration or pushing themselves back out or speeding up at, at certain times so yes, I do think it's a little more complicated. It's more complicated than just launching up and getting going at that speed. Um, so yes, I think you're right that there are corrections that, that orbits do decay sometimes. Uh, and the next part of the chapter we'll talk about is then, uh, and anyone want to take a guess right now, what if you were to go faster than eight kilometers per second? Anyone want to guess what would happen then? Rather than orbiting the planet, what would happen? Fly off in space. Yep, they call that escape velocity. And so that'll be the next thing we'll explore in the last part of chapter five, five point twelve. But we'll do that on Friday. So uh, I wanted to just use the last little bit of class. I think we got about ten minutes um, to uh, go over some Rube Goldberg stuff and give you some time to work on this. But it'll just roll over into homework as well. Uh, so this is task number five on the list on Canvas. 
And what I'd like you to do is I've collected about six videos here of Rube Goldberg machines and some are simple, some are complicated, but this is meant to just give you ideas of how you can use household items like a hardcover book or, you know, an, uh, athletic equipment, anything, even toilet paper rolls um, to build a simple machine. And the last video is one that I made just using my daughter's toys at home. You watched that in our previous lesson, but your assignment for Friday is, and what I'd like you to actually work on right now and after class if you can, is to just figure out what materials you have at home and take a picture of those materials to submit to me. So you don't have to build a machine yet, um, but I want you to try to find the materials that you can use to build a simple machine. Um, this is not the permanent one, this is just something simple that you can set up on a table on the floor. So, you know, things like hardcover books, dominoes if you have game sets, athletic equipment like golf balls, tennis balls, lacrosse balls. Uh, if you've got toys like a like train set or toy cars, those work really well. Household appliances, a lot of vacuums have the retractable wire. Uh, if you hit a switch, it pulls the wire back into the machine. So that's a fun thing to use. Uh, those little power strips often have like an on off switch on them. And so you could like plug something like a fan in. And if you have a book fall on the switch and activate it, the fan switches on and does something else. Um, those are all things that you could use. And so what I'd like you to do now is just watch a couple of these videos and start thinking about what you have at home that you could use to make a simple Rube Goldberg machine. And I just want you to submit a picture of those materials. You're looking for about four or five different things that you can use. Uh, and then we'll use class time on Friday to then try to put together a machine and you'll film it using Flipgrid and share with each other. Uh, and then the other homework will be a Hewitt reading 5.9 through 5.11, and you'll answer reading check questions 21, 23, 24, and 25, uh, all from that page 116 we've been using in the past. So right now, again, just check out some of those videos and start thinking about what materials you have at home. And if you want, really quick in the, in the next eight minutes or so, you can pile them up, submit a picture. But again, you can roll that over in the homework too for Friday. Uh, any questions on any of that? Instructions are all on campus too. So, um, okay, otherwise that is it for me. Um, thank you very much, have a good day and I'll hang around if you have any questions or need anything else from me. Have a good one.